As we head into the holidays, many people are opening up their wallets to give a little extra to those in need. But how we give is changing. Often it starts with a tragedy, an illness, or fueling an ambition. Then it goes viral, raising thousands of dollars for someone in need or for a particular cause. But as we see more personal crowdfunding, questions are being raised about how and why we give. As part of our continuing look back at 10 seasons of the agenda, we'll bring you a conversation around that. Then, a look into how and why we donate our time. On Giving, that's tonight on The Agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. It could be funding the building of a park, helping someone rebuild their home after disaster, supporting someone with huge medical bills. Social crowdfunding is changing how we help those in need. Joining us now for more on this, Daryl Hatton. He's founder and CEO at Fundraiser.com and Sabrina Nicosia, National Marketing Research Director at RaiseHope.org. And it's good to have you two in those chairs. Thanks for coming in at TVO. What's, uh, I mean, I, it's a fairly new term. I haven't seen this before. Personal crowdfunding or misery crowdfunding. Daryl, you want to tell us what that is? Well, I like the, the part of the personal crowdfunding a little better. As opposed to misery crowdfunding. As opposed crowdfunding. to misery crowdfunding. But, but there it, is a lot of that to it, isn't well, there? Well, it, it's helping people uh, use social media to raise money for almost any kind of cause, but particularly around things that, where they've had a financial crisis. They've had a house burned down. They've got a critical illness that they need extra treatment for. They may have to travel to that. They may want to have their spouse join them for that treatment because they live out of town. Mm -hmm. And it's helping to pay for those kinds of expenses where it, it's really funding and hopefully alleviating some of the misery that goes with these tragedies. Sabrina, how much of this is going on nowadays? A lot, and it's increased a lot in, in the most recent years. Um, I was looking up some stats in preparation for this show, and it's, it's tough to find stats specifically for Canada, um, but they're saying that the crowdfunding industry is doubling every year, and I've heard stats um, for 2015, the projections to be anywhere between uh, $10 billion to $20 billion, so I'm sure it falls somewhere in between oh, there. In North America alone or worldwide? Globally, globally. globally. Yeah. Say that number again. Ten billion, billion to twenty billion dollars. Yeah. These are just everyday people looking for. I mean, they haven't got this big organization underneath them or anything like that, right? It's just everyday people. Some of them, uh, you know, people raise money and crowdfund for a variety of things. A lot of it is for social causes, but there's also people who crowdfund for artistic reasons. Uh, people who are looking uh, to crowdfund for their business. So that that those numbers include all of those people. Can you give us a better understanding of what? persuades somebody to give money to somebody they almost certainly don't know. Well, it's interesting because that's one of the myths that gets started with crowdfunding. A lot of crowdfunding is really about the people in your community already and in your existing social networks who give money to help you out. So the best example is usually someone has a friend who has cancer or has had a problem. They'll start a campaign on behalf of that friend, share it on social media with their neighbors, their coworkers, their uh, you know, just the people in their community that are already there. That's where the first contributions come into a campaign. And then because of the ability to so of social media to spread that message much wider, mm -hmm. then you start having strangers who may look at this. But they're really still usually friends of friends. It's only once you get some media coverage and someone bec noticing this story and promoting it in a broader sense that you tend to have strangers donate mm -hmm. and contribute. And would you say most of the time it's just that first group? Most of the time, it's just the first group, sometimes the friends of friends, and rarely does it get up beyond rarely that without help. Fire. Here's the thing also, Sabrina. Uh, you know, if, if you write a check to the Salvation Army, you know who the Salvation Army is, you know what they're going to use it for, right. etc. How do you know when you're giving somebody something here in a crowdfunding, so, you know, you've responded to something on Facebook, how do you know yeah. it's the real deal? Well, I guess it depends what the campaign's all about. So if the campaign is about um, somebody personally needing money, um, a lot of times, and it's interesting, they've 
they've done some uh, research into that. The, the fraud rate's relatively low, they say, because, again, you're reaching out to your um, initial group. So if you um, are doing something fraudulent, you're probably not going to attract those types of people. Um, in the case of the charities, um, and it varies with platform to platform, but with our platform, if somebody's raising money for a charity, we give the money directly to the charity. So in, in those cases, you definitely know what's going there. But if they go through you, you take a cut, I assume, for providing that service? Exactly. We take a percentage of the donation or contribution amount. How much? So it's 5% if you reach your goal and 9% if you don't. We've seen, I mean, you're right, they're not frequent, but I think probably a lot of people watching this right now will remember a case of a young girl on Facebook who put a very heart-rending story out there about how she was dying of cancer and her last wish was dot, dot, dot. And she got a ton of money come in and then somebody outed her and said, this is just phony. I mean, what recourse do you have if you've been caught in a snag like that? A little bit of depends on time. If, if the community reports the campaign very, very early, there's a good chance that none of that money will actually go to, to the person and it can be refunded. And we work very closely with our payment processors on fraud avoidance and helping to uh, make sure that this kind of scenario can be dealt with very quickly if it happens. But um, it, it's really incumbent on the community to help report these things because there's no way that we as platforms can cost effectively vet all these causes and still make it possible for the people that are trying to do good things to do them and get the best results. You need the Twitter police to be on guard in some respects. <laughs> well, we, it's kind of neighborhood watch. Yeah. You really want to be looking over yeah. and helping make sure that this is, this is going to what they say it will go to. I'm going to raise a couple of examples here. Again, I suspect lots of people have heard about. There was this guy in Detroit who said he walked 33 kilometers to work. There was just an absolutely heartbreaking story of that young kid who walked out of a, mm. you know, an apartment building in Toronto yeah. uh, I don't know, 4 o'clock in the morning, froze to death. Uh, they, they, they were, there he is right there, poor little Elijah. Uh, these campaigns went viral and they raised hundreds of thousands of dollars in a few days. Mm -hmm. Again, for people that surely 95% of the people who gave didn't know. How often does that happen? Not very often. It's rare? Um, I would say that those are uh, the rare cases. Um, you know, it's interesting to note too that those are actually people who uh, campaigns were created on their behalf versus them creating their own campaigns, huh. let's say, to raise money for their cat's medical bills or whatever the case may be. And I think it's, you know, the, the common denominator with all of those is that it really sort of strikes a chord with all of us. You know, there was something inspiring about James who was walking to work every single day. It wasn't just about the fact that the bus route didn't cover where he needed to go or he didn't have a car. It was the fact that like through all of that, he persevered and he walked every single day. And of course, the story of Elijah, I mean, that touched so many people in Toronto and across the country, and, and that's what it is. I think it really, it resonates with us, and I think that's why those take off. Does the sector itself, there, there's uh, James Roberts, I guess he got a nice car at the end of the day, didn't he? I mean, <laughs> well, he raised the car was even donated to him huh. by a, a, a dealership that wanted to get their name associated with this media right. story now. Right. Yeah. Yep. Is this, I mean, these kinds of stories, you say they're rare, but when they go viral, a lot of attention paid to this kind of mm -hmm. fundraising. Do you, being in the sector, like these kinds of things? Um, I'm a bit of a mixed bag on it. Um, there's the, we don't want to take anything away from the person that is having that money raised for them. But there's a place where it's distorting the primary purpose of helping more at the community funding level, where crowdfunding initially started. And it also brings up a much greater opportunity for fraud. In the case with the fellow in Detroit, three different campaigns were started on his behalf. The, the first big one, and then there was a couple others that started. And it's, as platforms, we have to patrol for copycats because yeah. there's people that can take advantage of that interest and per, potentially divert funds. Do most campaigns succeed? No. They don't. No, they don't. Um, for every, you know, the stats are always changing, but for every 10 campaigns, probably half of them fail. Um, depending on this type of funding, there's uh, different types, fixed funding and flexible funding. Um, so depending on those factors, will sort of determine part of your success rate. Um, but, in the, but in the case of personal crowdfunding, which is usually always flexible funding, meaning you keep what you raise even if you don't reach your goal, um, I would say 40% fail rate. 40% fail rate, meaning they don't reach the goal. They don't reach, the, and they're, or they don't reach even close to their goal. They didn't even get you know, close to what they were trying to achieve. Is that your experience too? It is. There's, it's, sometimes it's based on what the expectation was. If they're expecting now from all the media coverage that they're going to raise $100,000 to help them with their, their cancer treatment, 
that's a very high bar and they might be disappointed. But if they had another fifteen or twenty thousand dollars come to them from friends and family, it's a win because they didn't have it before. And every every dollar can go towards solving that problem. It may not solve it, but it'll certainly make it better. Hmm. Does this, you know, on the one hand, it does make you feel good when you, you know, send in ten or twenty bucks to somebody who's really down in their luck, and and you know maybe you've got a chance to turn their life around. Does this give you a false sense, though, that you're repairing the world, if I can? use that pretentious expression, does it give you a false sense that you're repairing the world? Because in effect, you know, one guy's hit lightning in a bottle, but 99.9% .9 of everybody else who may be in the same situation, they're not going to get that kind of help at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Does that give you a like, pause well, at all? I, I think, you know, you know, people have been talking about, you know, um, with the, the example of James, you know, he great, we help one person, but it didn't solve the problem. It didn't solve the problem that Detroit has a, a bus route issue. Right. But I would say that maybe that's not the role of crowdfunding, and I think that you know there's people who are in charge of managing that bus route, and that's now, um, this campaign has shone a light on that. I mean, I didn't know that Detroit had a bus route problem, but now I do, and, and a lot more people do. So I think if the policymakers and the key decision makers use this as their ally, as a friend, as a way to shine a light on an issue, then I think that it's a positive thing. This sets up nicely the discussion to come. So stay put one second, everybody. Up next, we're going to broaden this discussion and bring traditional charities into the conversation right after this. Social crowdfunding is changing how people in need are helped. Joining us now to add their perspective, traditional philanthropists. We welcome Bruce McDonald. He's the CEO at Imagine Canada. Marina Glogovats, CEO of Canada Helps. Caroline Riseborough, director with the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Mark Bloomberg, partner in nonprofit and charity law and philanthropy with Bloomberg Siegel LLP. And we welcome back Daryl Hatton and Sabrina Nicosia. Would you classify giving to a, a personal crowdfunding campaign, the likes of which we were just discussing, would you call that charitable giving? Well, I mean, I, I think the notion of crowdfunding has been around forever. I mean, if you can, you can actually go back as far as the Statue of Liberty, where there was a crowdfunding campaign to pay for the pedestal, because it wasn't paid for when it arrived in, in the U.S., and it's been going on forever. So I think the notion of people wanting to help people because they see an instantaneous need has been around for a long time, and I think is going to continue. Is that charity, though? In well, the way I, that you understand it, with CRA well, tax I mean, returns and all of that. I mean, the, the definition of charity, which has been around since the 1600s, uh, you know, I, I think that there are obviously rules and regulations that charities need to adhere to. Uh, and I think one of the challenges with crowdfunding is, is this lack of accountability that, that happens there. So I, I think it's important that when Canadians are thinking about where they give their money, that they actually take a look as to, is it going to an individual, a family, or an institution that has those checks and balances in I place? I asked the question, Caroline, and I saw you shaking your head like this. <laughs> so what are you trying to say? Well, I think if we go back to the definition of charity and philanthropy in particular, it is really the use of private resources, often given by individuals, for public benefit. And that is a very important term, public benefit. And when we take a look at some of these crowdfunding platforms, we are now using private resources for private individuals and for their benefits. That is not charity and philanthropy. And I think we touched on this earlier that oftentimes what, what's, what's being facilitated with these crowdfunding platforms is private individuals are benefiting, but we're not addressing the systemic issues that need fixing. And this is where charity comes in. Our, our quality of life is dependent upon the charitable and nonprofit sector being able to address these underlying issues that have public benefit for all of us. And this is actually diverting resources away from that. And that, it, that is really my concern as, as a fundraiser and here representing the Association of Fundraising Professionals. The distinction, Mark, that Caroline is making, does that matter? 
Uh, yeah, I do think it does matter. Um, in some cases, some of the individuals uh, that are being the money is being raised for in terms of crowdfunding, they could, in a sense, be considered uh, some uh, something charitable. But generally speaking, most of the stuff would be very broad, and and it would probably not be, and there would be a huge private benefit for some of them. Uh, so it wouldn't be charitable. And I agree with Caroline's point that the the biggest problem is what if we rely too much on crowdfunding, we're basically turning our social safety net into a bit of a lottery. So that instead of providing things that are really necessary that we all can agree are really important that everyone get them it now becomes you have to have a great story you have to be lucky enough to have someone who's media savvy and if one in ten thousand you'll luck it out and you'll get a hundred thousand dollars but for many of the other people you know their their target might be a hundred or two hundred dollars and they're raising ten dollars over a year period so they're hardly making very much so it very much is a situation where a small number will potentially win a lot, as in a lottery, but um, most uh, who are getting involved will not get much out of it. Sabrina, I'm not hearing the love around the table here for, uh, <laughs> for what it is you guys do. Do you want to respond to some well, of this? Well, I think it's interesting. So, I mean, there's so many different types of campaigns. Um, of course, charities can fundraise for themselves and encourage their supporters to fundraise on their behalf. So I think in that sense, of course, if the money's going to a charity, then it's charitable. Um, but in some of these, I guess what we're calling the misery campaigns, um, it's sort of like an emergency fund too. Although, you know, the person who, James, who was walking in Detroit, that wasn't the case. But let's say something happened and someone's house burned down. Um, usually they would set up a bank account at, you know, at one of the major banks and people would just donate to that. So in those cases, um, you know, at least there's some transparency here. And a lot of those um, campaigns that we're talking about, people saw that they had reached their goal and people kept donating. And, um, you know, I'm not so sure that, and I, I'm not, you know, I don't know, but I think that if I'm a supporter of a charity, if I've decided to then donate to the Elijah Marsh campaign, that it wouldn't come out of my budget for giving to the charity that I support, that it would be in addition to. Although it is interesting, I mean, because there's a there's an interesting contradiction with crowdfunding and, and the support of the existing charitable organizations. I mean, charities right now are kind of under what I would call unparalleled scrutiny in terms of uh, cost of administration and overhead and, and being accountable and transparent for those dollars and also ensuring that the, the money that's donated, that there are outcomes and impact for those. It's, it's interesting, though, that at the same time as society is demanding this, this very open and transparent look at charities, that people will give money with absolutely no checks and balances in place. So anyone can go and start a fund, fundraising campaign. And that is a real challenge because the fundraising profession is governed by certain ethical principles. And it's really the wild, wild west through some of these crowdfunding crowdfunding platforms. And so I think the concern of all, in all of this is how are people going out there doing fundraising with the ethics that we've put in place? So for instance, the donor accountability, ensuring the donations go where the donor intended to, the transparency, the stewardship that happens after. None of this is happening. And then the other piece that we're not necessarily talking about, but I think we should touch on, is a percentage of the donations go to these for-profit companies that are creating these, these crowdfunding platforms. And so it's a very lucrative model. In fact, there's some interesting research that came out of Europe recently that found that nonprofit fundraising crowdfunding campaigns actually do better than those crowdfunding campaigns focused on business. So it's actually to the benefit of for-profit companies to get involved in this type of crowdfunding because there's, there's money on the table to Sabrina, be had. you want to speak to that? Which part of it? <laughs> well, let's let's talk. Let's good point. Let's pick up on the last part there, which is that this is. I mean, while you may be doing good in the world, it's a hell of a good business opportunity as well. I mean, we do live in a capitalist society, so I'm not sure this is a terrible thing. But yeah, you and I think speak to that? I think in most cases, there's usually uh, when someone's facilitating something, there's a, a fee involved in that. Um, you know, with the case of. Um, Movember, for example, that money goes to Prostate Cancer Canada, but Movember takes a, a cut of that, right? Because they're doing certain things. They're advertising. They put this program together. They are, you know, the flow through. Movember so, is a charity now in Canada. But they so do take money. They do take a percentage before that money goes somewhere. So I think, I think I'm, I'm not so sure that's such a bad thing. Um, and I think it's just part of doing business. We're creating the platform. Uh, we have costs involved in that. Um, so, yeah. I think you all know Elizabeth Renzetti around this table. She writes in the Globe and Mail, an uh, interesting commentator on our society. Uh, let me read a little of what she wrote recently and see if this provokes any of you to a response. As the social safety net phrase, the needy and desperate have turned to websites such as Hand Up, GoFundMe, and You Caring to meet their basic needs. Needs that would have been met 
even a couple of decades ago by community or government services. And while it's lovely to see the great generosity of donors, it's also enraging, she says, to think that there are a vast number of people who have had to resort, in essence, to online begging. What should be the work of society is fobbed off onto good-hearted individuals with tablets. What do we think? We know that donors are predisposed to wanting to help an individual directly. And there is very much an emotional connection with philanthropy and with giving. But it's not necessarily the best thing in terms of the benefit for society. Because oftentimes, taking an approach to change the system, uh, so preventing, let's say, mental illness versus addressing it once someone is already in a, in a desperate situation, is really where we need to funnel the funds. So really taking more of a preventative approach as opposed to addressing the need once it strikes. And, and but, that is a part of the challenge. But I think one of the areas that we talk about there is that that is a long-term scenario. And we're talking about funding friends, neighbors, coworkers. Now. Now. Not waiting for the longer-term societal change to happen. If we have someone in our lives that is severely influenced or affected by a disease, if we have to wait for that to funnel it through the proper channels to build the proper programs, that person may die in that time frame. The, one of the epiphany we had with fundraiser was the first year when we had someone say, because you helped our daughter get treatment faster, we think you helped save her life. That wasn't waiting for a program to take care of her. They had to do it because she was dying of leukemia. On the other hand, Mark, is there a concern here that, that people who do good by going to fundraiser or whatever, they're helping one person, but they're not helping society. They may, you, may, you may be under the impression that you're helping society, but you're not. Is that a concern? Absolutely. If there was proper government funding, for example, of hospitals and health care and alternative types of health care, uh, then you wouldn't have to rely on one person getting onto a crowdfunding platform or someone doing it on their behalf. Uh, because there could be 10,000 people and 9,999 are being ignored. Mm -hmm. So I think we're completely ignoring the systemic issue of as a society, if we decide that we don't want homeless people in the middle of winter, then we need to put resources to it and not rely on, well, that homeless person has a particularly good story and therefore we'll help them. There are a huge number of agencies who are out there. They need more uh, commitment of resources and we need to have things like affordable housing and that. How many daycares have been built through crowdfunding, you know? And without daycare, you, you, you don't have a lot of the benefits that people get. So, so Sabrina, let me ask you then. Are you concerned that through the good works that you're doing, you're giving the public a false sense of them actually making a greater contribution to a societal problem. I feel like that's not quite the role for crowdfunding. I mean, that's an entirely separate thing. Crowdfunding, um, you know, we need the charities around. We need their insight. We need their strategic thinking. We need them to work hard to solve these systemic issues and execute on those on those um, on those missions. So I don't think that's the role of crowdfunding. But as I mentioned previously, I think crowdfunding does shine light on issues that have come up. And I think if people take advantage of those media moments, that it could, it could work for everybody. It's interesting though, I hear you saying we still need the, the, the bigger, more mainstream charities course, yeah. to do that good society-wide work. I hear them saying you're eating their lunch and they're nervous about that. Yeah, and I think, I'm not sure that it comes out of a different budget for somebody. If you're going to donate to a one-off campaign to help the homeless man on the street, I'm not sure that I'm taking that away from my annual or monthly give that I give to another, Do that I give that? to a charity. Does everybody know that? Well, Does charity Charity giving is not increasing dramatically in Canada. In fact, the number of donors is decreasing. So I think there is a bit of an argument that the, the philanthropic dollars are limited in Canada right now for a number of different reasons. And diverting funds to immediate causes are, are great. I'm not in any way saying that these, these causes aren't needed, but they can't take away from some of the systemic issues that we have to address as a sector. I, I, think, it's, I think it's important that we understand that, that some of these issues, whether it's homelessness, poverty, you know, mental health issues, these are complex issues that require staying power and commitment in order to have a real and honest change. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think the important part is that people are informed and they make their choices so that they understand where their dollars are going because we, we do need that profound change. That's what I was going to say. I mean, I think the crowdfunding as a, as a technique, as a new thing, is here to stay. Mm -hmm. And I, but, you know, I think, and um, I know that in the States in 2013, out of $5 billion, which was the overall crowdfunding market, about 30% of that went to charity, so one third. 
Um, I think, like you guys are saying, for me, the question is, an ex exciting one, is can this new collaborative peer-to-peer -peer, uh, based giving be used to actually cultivate more strategic, more proactive philanthropy, one that invests into capacity and infrastructure and systemic problem solving that will benefit everybody, right? And I think there are some, I just ran across this site called um, uh, Change Gangs. So it's a collaboration of a group of what, people. Sorry, what's Change it Gangs. Change, Change Gangs, gangs in, the, in the States. It's a collaborative philanthropy where a group of people chooses a charity based on data and evidence and the platform actually helps them evaluate it and then they commit to it. So, I mean, it's you know an emergent model, it's small. Uh, there are charities like givedirectly.org who use data and also this type of direct appeal to facilitate giving. I think something else may emerge that uses this incredibly powerful peer-to-peer uh, movement to maybe uh, cultivate more strategic giving, which I agree is really needed. It, it, what we have is really taking some focus away from the fact that, uh, that we need capacity building, we need infrastructure, we need investment to scale social profit and to really solve some of the pressing and but systemic you're issues. you're talking about government now, aren't you, pretty much, or certainly massive Listen, private sector was, involvement I, in government? Yeah, I was in the private sector up until two years ago, so I'm still learning about the ecosystem here. But one thing that I noticed first is that it's incredibly absurd to step into the sector where you realize that nobody funds for capacity, that all these organizations are starved of essential capacity, and that's just how it is. And then expect them to really scale and to increase their impact. And I think the crowdfunding is kind of taking us away from that thought. Well, let me pick up on this. Now. I'm going to assume that Sabrina and Daryl, you two, at some point in your lives, have given to good old-fashioned mainstream charities. Mm -hmm. You're both nodding your head, mm -hmm. yes. Now I want to find out whether you two, or you two, have ever contributed to a crowdfunding campaign. Have you? Anybody? On, online? Yeah. No, I, but have I done it other ways? Yes. What other ways? Well, I mean, the old-fashioned way. You went to your local bank, and you, that's where you made the contribution. Got it. But you've never done it never I online. Have. Caroline? No, I haven't. Never have. No, never. Mark, no? I got asked recently by a friend's friend whose daughter needed a treatment in Germany, and then I looked up the platform, <laughs> and all sorts of weird stuff came up. And, you know, plus they were charging like 12% all in, and I thought, wow, like I'm not comfortable giving through this platform. So you I mean, weren't I sure went that direct. there might have been some monkey business going yeah, on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, and and, it, was, and it was very yesterday. pricey. It was incredibly yeah. pricey. So, I mean, I don't know. I still feel the fees are important here, uh, especially when it, uh, you know, especially when it comes to charitable giving. But so I wasn't comfortable. Sure. So I wasn't comfortable. I was just asked yesterday. I was on Facebook and I was looking at my feed and I saw um, a friend of mine who was asking for donations for a gentleman who was going to rehab, which was obviously of interest to me given my role at, at CAMH. And I looked at the site, and as I was going through it, I realized this is a for-profit site. They told me that there's no charitable donation being issued. There's going to be no accountability for exactly how my money is, is going to help this individual. And those are sort of the, the bedrock and foundation of philanthropy, and, and I struggled with that. As much as the cause was great, I just wasn't sure it was going to have the impact that it could have had had I given to a well-known charity that I know is going to be accountable to me. So one, one of the things I would look at here is asking the people who are affected by crowdfunding whether or not they care about the fees. And of campaigns that have, have the reasonable success with our platform, we get a 9 out of 10 rating in terms of they don't care about the fee because it's money that's come to them in a way that they weren't able to get before. So I, I hear your concerns about the efficiency of that, but in their terms, they solved the problem they were looking to solve at a fee that they were comfortable to pay. So we can argue but, about where that should be spent, but they, they are the ones that are the beneficiary. They were essentially the consumer. Right, but it, you know, in a society where there, these lines are blurring between the types of structures that are out there, mm -hmm. this huge emphasis on looking at the cost of overhead, cost of fundraising, cost of administration mm -hmm. for your kind of classic charities, you know, for us, I, that, that makes me a little nervous in the sense that if there's a sense that they're rising costs and people aren't delineating about the form and, and structure, I, I think that's concerning. Is there room, Mark, in this big, at this table and in this world for your two different types of model of charitable giving to get along? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I don't. I think that you have to define what you mean by crowd uh, funding. And so, Marina's organization has been around for 15 years, basically doing this type of work. And uh, you know, there are ones that raise money for charities, and it's really just using the technology for that. And then you have other ones where they raise money for charities or other causes which may or may not have a huge private benefit. So we have to divide that up. And then we have to realize because crowdfunding has been around for a few years, we've already seen quite a few years actually in the UK. The Charity Commission jumped in to stop a particular platform where they were basically taking the money that was supposed to go to help these various people and in fact using it to pay for all their operational costs. And this is the accountability transparency issue. And unless you have some sort of real regulatory uh, approach, um, unfortunately you're putting a lot of money into pools and some of that money will sit there and it will be used for uh, purposes that were not what was expected by the uh, person giving the money. I guess I should ask the flip side of the earlier question, which is, Daryl and Sabrina, have you ever given to crowdfunding campaigns? Yes. You have. Yeah. And, and, and you have too. Yeah. Yeah. And just to, to key on to your point about the pooling of funds, both Sabrina and I's platforms work on a very important principle, which is the money flows directly from the contributor to the, the recipient and not pooled by us. We do not hold the money. And we, in fact, helped PayPal and other payment processors develop these techniques to make sure that this would flow completely and clearly through to the user. So there isn't the risk that the platform would, absor would run away with the funds. Okay. And, and, and Last sorry, and, and in our case, um, when someone donates to a charity, we verify that charity and we actually issue, we partner with Canada Helps and we issue tax receipts. So people, in our case, there, there are checks and balances in place and, and uh, accountability is something that um, could be an issue with other platforms, okay. I guess is what you're saying. We are going to veer off in a slightly different direction, but before we do that, parting is such sweet sorrow. Daryl and Sabrina, we thank you for coming in tonight and helping thank us you. out with this. Thank Good to have so you both much. on the program. Coming up next, we're going to explore how technology is shaking up the traditional philanthropy sector right after this. Technology has shaken up many industries and sectors. Is philanthropy immune? Doubt it. We'll continue our conversation now with Bruce McDonald of Imagine Canada, Marina Glogovats of Canada Helps, Caroline Riseborough, who is with the Association of Fundraising Professionals, and Mark Bloomberg, who is with Bloomberg Siegel LLP. Let's start with this. Technology, especially the internet, has brought massive changes to basically everything that we do in life, banking, media, travel, dating, watching television, everything. Um, I want to get a better understanding of what it's done to your lives. Marina, do you want to start us off here? Um, yes, I can. I mean, I, as I said, I only got into the charitable sector about two years ago. I think on the whole, and I don't know whether you guys agree, I think that, ch that technology has transformed the charitable sector less than any of these other areas that, uh, that you mentioned, music, newspaper. And I think that's understandable because we're dealing with an incredibly complex, this is not a vertical, mm -hmm. this is an incredibly complex uh, industry. Uh, but uh, the, I mean, obviously the online donations are growing more than, uh, they're growing more than the overall donations. There are uh, lots of new um, online technologies that charities are using. It's very easy to uh, give now. Some, it's very easy to give. It's very easy to give everywhere. Um, there is, uh, you know, there, there, there are new, uh, and social media obviously has been used by charities and embraced by charities in a big way. And overall, I think the technology has had democratizing and sort of leveling the playing field uh, effect like it has had in many other areas in that small charities, big charities have the same access to social media marketing, uh, to sharing, to online, some of the online tools uh, that everybody else has. I, I was interested in the dynamic between traditional charities and these new crowd fundraising things here. And, and there does seem to be a considerable amount of disquiet among you traditional folks that these guys are eating your lunch. It, it would be nice if the crowdfunding was in addition to what people already give mainline charities. Is the fear, in fact, that that's not happening, that, in fact, what they give them, they're taking away from you? Um, I, 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 I can't say that because I don't think we know. I don't think we too know. Too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. I don't know if 
I, I'm not aware of any study that... Uh, Caroline, you know, speak to that, that at all? Well, there, ha there has been some interesting research taking a look at the giving patterns of, let's say, millennials versus boomers. Mm -hmm. So we know that when the millennials hit the boomer age, almost all philanthropy will pop probably be online. And actually, a lot of them love the crowdfunding platforms because they really have a desire to bring in their peers to philanthropy. So while we saw the boomers and the generation before them want to give to philanthropy because they saw it almost as a duty to give back, this new generation doesn't feel that same duty of giving back. They want to be involved in this because... Uh, uh, really, how do, you, how, how do you know that? Well, th there's been studies on this issue, actually. Academic studies that have taken a look at the intrinsic and extrinsic, in extrinsic motivation of millennials versus boomers. And they've actually found that millennials are more of a generation me than a generation we. We don't have any millennials at this table, and I feel bad about that right now because I think you're maligning a whole sector of people, and, and they're not going to be happy to hear that. Well, I think there's, yeah. uh, with the younger generation, there's many great things, including their interest in international philanthropy, which I think is really important. So there's a lot of great things that one can say, and uh, yes, uh, you know, one can look at the broader picture, but when I see a lot of uh, people getting involved with charities, a lot of them are very young people. Uh, my main concern is, well, first of all, with a lot of these fundraising platforms, the crowdfunding, some of the money is going to charity, and so that's not really then yeah. making a diversion. Version. But my main concern is what we've seen is that already some of these platforms have been going under or being yeah. shut down. Hmm. And, uh, you know, how important is it, you know, that there is some sort of regulatory uh, oversight because basically a lot of money potentially, sometimes it could be millions of dollars, uh, is going to, into these platforms and there is really no accountability. Did the money actually go out? Did the money, um, you know, uh, some of these campaigns I've looked at, I know we talk about the big campaigns with hundreds of thousands, but if you dig a little deeper into these websites, you'll see there have been campaigns going on for two years to raise $200 and they're at $20 now. So really, 99% of the people are raising almost nothing. And But all those $20, $50, $100 starts to add up to quite a bit of money. And where's the oversight? Who's looking at it? And if you expect the oversight to come from the beneficiary, who ultimately may get a check, they're probably not going to be the ones though, who are going to do that. It, it, it's interesting, and I, I think and there's some great points. One of the things I find interesting about this, this, this boom of crowdfunding is the, is the notion of the idea that it's maybe not either or, and I think that was said before, but, but the idea of, of fostering a generosity of spirit that anybody has access to quickly. And I think the charities have been incredibly inventive over the years of adapting to change. You know, I mean, direct mail was invented at some point. Then we saw the ice bucket challenge. I mean, there's all these examples out there. I don't know that it's a bad thing for society mm -hmm. that people are generous of spirit and I think that it's, it's a way for, you know, now it's up to charities to find their path with the new technology and, and potentially new values. But it sounds like you are concerned that they can compete more effectively with the mainstream charities when it comes to impact. Um, no, actually, I don't, I don't believe that to be true. I, 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 I'm, the concern I have about the particular vehicle on the platform is this lack of checks and balances that are in place to understand is the money go for, going for what it's intended and are the outcomes that are being derived what the donor hoped they would be. Hmm. And I think charities have spent a lot of time, do a lot of work on that area to make sure that donors understand that we are in fact helping to transform society. Can you learn anything from the way they do charitable fundraising? Can the oh, mainstream absolutely. charities? Yeah. Absolutely. As I said, there is, you know, I think crowdfunding and all these other technology driven uh, trends are here to stay. They are going to be driven by millennials. It's fundamentally about a different way, different desire to engage in a different way. Um, I think when I think about a technology driven future, one thing that I want to say that is, I think, of a biggest concern uh, to me is small, medium sized charities. So there is a massive long tail in Canada of small and medium-sized charities. Can you give an example of what's a small and medium-sized one? Medium and a small charity would be someone who typically would have two, three, four, up to maybe 10, 12 people would be raising annually less than $250,000. Okay. And that is actually most charities, right? Like we don't realize that there is a top heavy, you know, the distribution curve is very much top heavy and most giving goes to top charities who are sophisticated marketers, sophisticated users, users of technology and have the capacity and that's wonderful. But we do have this massive long tail of small charities and when we go and, and when you go and visit them and we work with them in Canada Helps, you see that that technology divide of you know, technology haves and have nots is really a, a possibility. Concerning? Very concerning because you look at you know, charities that where that lack of capacity infrastructure is particularly 
um, obvious when you look at their technological infrastructure and their preparedness to actually come into this new era that will be a lot about technology and adapting to all these new things. I mean, I think that's an interesting... You said earlier um, you've got tens of thousands of charities on your site that people can give to. Who, who gets most of the money? Name names. Most of the well, I I can't name, name names, but most of the money goes to the charities that we all that we all hear about. You can look at the T thirty ten filings. Mark would know this better. Yeah, you, okay, you you Mark. can look at the T thirty ten filings with the Canada which, Revenue which Agency. Which organizations get the get the most? You, you'd money. have to look it up, and you can, and basically see what the largest amounts are that are going. But it's going to be large charities in general are going to get the largest amounts of money. Heart and Stroke Foundation. Yes, unless they do it off their own website, in which case, in some cases, they may not use Canada Helps much. But um, in you general, know. Yeah, these are just general stats. But Most they're, charities. They're the same in the States as well. I mean, yeah. it's, it's just the way it is. Right. Most charities in Canada have revenue under 100,000. <laughs> Most charities in Canada do not have one single staff person. So hmm. we're talking about the perception of charities being you know, very large that's institutions, right. hospitals, uh, Heart and Stroke Foundation, things like that. And that's absolutely a very important part of the charity sector. But there are also a lot of smaller charities. And for them, it is a little bit harder sometimes to grapple with technology and deal with things. So maybe some of this new technology can actually be helpful for them. It can uh, increase the scope of the, the people that might support them and things like that. Let's finish off on that, Caroline. How are you going to get the millennials to start giving uh, in, a, in a more fulsome way to the mainline charities, uh, online or offline for that matter? Well, you know, I think actually once millennials mature and they move into the age of the, that the boomers are now, it's very well that they will probably become more charitable. They'll have more disposable income. They'll realize that it's time to give back. So, you know, I'm not trying in any way to, to malign the millennials. They play a very, very important role in charity. But I do think as we're starting to see what really motivates their giving versus, let's say, past generations, it really is that sense of coming together with, with their peers, with their networks, and being able to do something really meaningful and tangible. And so I think that's where some of the digital platforms allow us to do things that we weren't able to do, let's say, 20 years ago. Gotcha. That's got to be the last word. Oh, actually, one last thing. Mark, where's that accent from? South Africa. Because I heard a little, it sounded like a little hint of Irishness in there, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, Irish. No. And yours, Marina? Serbian. Montenegrian. Okay, Montenegro. There we go. It used to be the same country, but Ooh. now evidently it's not. We love accents on this show. I love listening to different accents. Okay, thanks to Bruce McDonald, Marina Glogovac, Caroline Riseborough, and Mark Bloomberg for being with us tonight here on TVO. Up next, while we are generous with our wallets, turns out we are more like the Grinch when it comes to donating our time. We'll explore that right after this. During the holidays, many people open their wallets for charitable giving, but what about charitable doing? In the course of any given year, Canadians donate almost two billion hours of their time to charities. While that's a lot, it's actually down from past years. Joining us now for more, Paula Spivak. She's president and CEO of Volunteer Canada. Best of the season to you, and thanks for coming in Thank tonight. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let's go through some of the numbers here uh, regarding who volunteers in this country, and then we'll chat coming out of this. Sheldon, Absolutely. if you would, this graphic. Six out of ten Canadians have volunteered at some point in their lives. In the year 2013, volunteers gave, as we suggested, almost two billion hours of their time. That's equivalent to almost a million full-time, year-round jobs volunteers. 37% of Canadian volunteers give time one or two times per year. 7% of Canadian volunteers give their time daily. And if you want to know who does it, two-thirds of Canadians are aged 15 to 19. They volunteer. Almost half of Canadians in their mid-30s to early 40s volunteer. And a little more than a quarter of Canadians who are 75 plus volunteer. Okay, Paula, lots of numbers there to chew on, so yeah. what do they tell us, or what do they tell you, I guess, more importantly, about who volunteers in this country? 
Well, first of all, it's amazing that we have 12.7 um, million Canadians volunteering, 44% of people 15 and over volunteering. That's really a generous uh, country and a lot going on in communities. Uh, people volunteer at different times of their lives, uh, different circumstances, uh, and like everything else in our life, we have to pace ourselves and honour what's going on um, in terms of our giving. So the six out of ten who do volunteer, you're not distressed about the fact that four out of ten at no point in their life ever volunteer? Because that's what that suggests. Well, one of the things that the statistics uh, capture is formal volunteering through organizations, which is really important, and we're really thankful for Statistics Canada for including that in the Canadian Social Survey year after year. Um, having said that, we also want to really broaden our concept and people's concepts of volunteering. When you think about of all the wonderful things that go on between neighbors, within families, um, informal ways of helping, which is just as important. And so while some people may choose to volunteer, here through organizations, very important. Uh, it's as important to just be generous and spontaneous about your giving. So that six out of ten may not capture the whole picture in that regard. Exactly. Okay, now I gotta confess here. When I saw two-thirds of Canadians age 15 to 19 volunteer, my spidey senses went, really? Really? You, bet. you believe that? Absolutely. So one of the things that's wonderful is that youth uh, engagement is very high, and it's always been high. And those that'll say, oh, it's just because they have to because of the graduation requirements in high school, not the case. Youth have always had the highest volunteer rate of all the age groups, even before the program existed. And when you look at what they're doing, um, in uh, Ontario, for example, you have to do 40 hours over four years. Well, youth of that age are doing well over 100 hours every year. Why do you so figure? They care about what's going on. They see that in small ways every day they can make a difference. And it is human nature to um, want to make the world a better place. So this picture that, that probably too many of us have of the 16-year-old kid never getting off the couch playing video games all the time, not doing anything socially relevant for society, it's out of date? It is. It is. And I'm really optimistic not only about the volunteering, but about the ideas coming forward. And I'm also really optimistic about all generations and how we're all working together. And I think that there's less of a breakdown. I, you probably find this, that um, your peers are your peers. And the things that you care about and bring you together, age isn't necessarily part of that. Two billion hours, almost, people volunteer. Absolutely. Very difficult, I suspect, to answer this, but doing what? Well, that's the wonderful thing. You could do almost anything. So if, for example, you are really excited about historical events and you want to reenact a historical event, you could actually play a role as a king and get dressed up. And that's really valuable because it adds to people's understanding of what went on at a certain period of time. You could also um, mentor someone who is starting a business. You may be really talented and want to sing and, and entertain people. Uh, perhaps you're really concerned about people and food security, so you could feed people and be part of a feeding program, but you could also really raise awareness of um, the importance of food security in communities and in, in terms of public policy. You could serve on a board and help with strategies. You could infuse an organization with new ideas and different ways of doing things. It's, it's, uh, it's really a, pr a pretty endless. wide story. Absolutely. Does it matter to you whether people volunteer because it makes them feel better as opposed to because it contributes to somebody else feeling better? Well, I'm of the opinion that, like every good relationship, it's two ways and everybody's needs have to be met. And we've always known that volunteering certainly contributes to community and makes society better. At the same time, we've also known that it does great things for us. You may have heard of the Helper's High, where there's actually a physiological response to helping someone else, where um, many stress-related illnesses actually can be um, prevented and reduced because of the great feeling you get and um, the, the, the reduction in stress. There's skills development, learning new, uh, new skills, exploring um, your career. Perhaps you want to feel socially connected to a place that you've just moved into. There's all kinds of benefits to volunteering, and I think the fact that you could contribute and gain at the same time, and it's a two-way relationship, makes it really dynamic. I get all that. We're going to put some new numbers up here, and then I want you to tell me how distressed you are by these numbers. Okay. Because if we look at 2010, we got 13.3 million Canadians volunteering. Yep. 
Then three years later, it's down. 12.7 million Canadians volunteering. And we do have to point out that more than half of all volunteer hours are actually done by just 10% of those who volunteer. So I wonder if any of that is a concern for you. Well, on one hand, um, it may simply be a matter of demographics. As people get older, the volunteer rate drops. However, people contribute more hours. On the other hand, we're not going to ignore it. I think that it is really up to us in the nonprofit and voluntary sector, those of who, who uh, engage volunteers every day, to really have a, a look at how we're, how we're offering meaningful opportunities to people. And so, for example, on one hand, we are proud of the fact that we have all these systems and structures and practices in place to uh, safely involve people. So there's application forms and interviews and things that uh, parallel other human resources practices. We may have um, created a situation where people feel that that is too bureaucratic, where it's cumbersome. And let's face it, people don't need to go through organizations to do great things together. So one of the things that we're starting to talk about in the sector is how do we, on one hand, uphold the quality and the safety of our programs, but also make space for this wonderful, spontaneous, organic um, activity and those movements that are happening. So we're going to need to embrace that and connect with that. One follow-up on those numbers, though. If, if just 10% of the people are volunteering half the time, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, there's a very good question of, but if that 10% is, is an older demographic, yeah. once they're no longer with us, that's a huge uh, vacancy to fill. Are you confident there are people coming up who are younger who will fill that breach? I'm absolutely confident that the, um, those in the younger um, years who are, have a higher rate of volunteering, though they may be volunteering fewer hours right now, that makes sense because of what's going on in their life, that if we um, honor their experiences and make it qual a quality experience and meaningful, then they will continue. Now that doesn't mean that we're not concerned at all. I think we have to better understand some of the barriers to volunteering. As I said, it could be um, the way organizations are structured and the, and, and the need to be more flexible. But it could also be the fact that um, at certain times in our life, uh, we've talked a lot about the sandwich generation where you have um, responsibility for uh, children, um, partners, aging parents, mm -hmm. aging grandparents, a lot of roles that we play in our lives. And the community supports and caregiving services that may have been in place at one point have also reduced and there's much more burden put on family. So that's something we're looking into. Is that a barrier to volunteering? Whose responsibility though at the end of the day do you see it being to imbue in a 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kid the notion that volunteering is something you need to start doing now and make it a habit for the rest of your life? So first of all, people do see um, volunteering happening within their families and with uh, extended families and neighbors. Um, they often uh, participate in schools and get exposure there. And certainly um, some of the programs that we see um, here in Ontario, there are programs through the um, provincial government that, that encourage youth to volunteer and honor that um, in the spring. There's also a new type of volunteering that has um, emerged over the last decade, which is employer-supported volunteering. And many businesses, as you know, encourage employees to volunteer, recognize um, their contributions in terms of time by matching it with donations to charities. They'll organize group volunteering activities. And believe it or not, a third of those um, um, volunteers, the 12.7 million Canadians who volunteer, a third of them said that they got support through their work place. And um, that's something we're paying a lot of attention to it's at Volunteer Canada. You didn't give me the answer I thought you were. Parents. Isn't it the parent's job to imbue in their child from an, as early an age as possible the sense that volunteering is something you have to do and you have to do it for the rest of your life? Well, as I was mentioning, families, absolutely. Hmm. It may be parents and it may be aunts and it may be extended family. Gotcha. You're absolutely right. I think that um, when, when children see um, volunteering modeled, they, they want to do it. But you've uh, twigged another thought, which is the idea of family volunteering, that um, there are more opportunities now for families and people of uh, multiple generations in an extended family to do something together. And they're choosing to do that because it's a way to spend quality time together, to pass on values, mm -hmm. and to see each other in a different light. Um, outside the dynamics within the family and within the home. And so there's lots of great opportunities in terms of family volunteering, in terms of volunteering through, through schools and service clubs, 
um, we are sociable beings, and group volunteering is great, as well as the one-to-one, -one, which is very meaningful and we, important. We do need that personal interaction, which makes me wonder, in an increasingly atomized society where our major relationships tend to be with computers or with other humans through computers, through social media, uh, are, are those barriers to our volunteering more? I think they can be seen as vehicles to connect people to volunteering. Hmm. Um, certainly organizations are engaging people through social media, but one of the things we talk about at Volunteer Canada is a spectrum of engagement. And so rather than seeing volunteering as that um, narrow space where someone is actively in an organization on a regular basis, when you think about um, being engaged by following um, an issue that matters to you, so whether it is youth homelessness um, or another social justice issue, just informing yourself is a way of mm. engaging and connecting with community, which you may do through social media, passing on information. Uh, and it may lead to other forms of engagement, but even in and of itself, it's really an important thing. Okay, in which case, in our last 20 seconds here, we know people watching this right now are getting hit up for money all the time during this time of year. Do you want to make the pitch for why they shouldn't just think about the money, but they should actually think about the doing as well? Financial resources are very important to organizations, as is the time and the energy. What I would also encourage people to do during this time is they may be motivated to volunteer, and there may be organizations that have the need right away. It may also be the perfect time to start to explore what issues are important to you because uh, organizations and communities need volunteers year-round. Um, think about volunteering in a broader sense. It's not just somebody okay helping someone who's not okay. All of us have something to give and all of us ha need to live in community and it's really a way of shaping the communities we want to live in now and in the future and if people don't know where to start, there's lots of great volunteer centers in local communities who can help you get connected. And I presume Volunteer Canada's website wouldn't be a bad place to start Absolutely. out. Absolutely. Volunteer.ca you look, uh, find your local volunteer center, and that's where the action is for sure. Paula Spivak, we thank you for volunteering to come into our studio tonight and tell us all about this. You bet. Best of the season to you. And to you. And that is the agenda for Friday, December 18th, 2015. The agenda is taking a break for a couple of weeks for TVO's holiday programming. We'll be back in the new year, and you will see a lot of changes as we celebrate our 10th season here on TVO. A new look, a new studio, and new perspectives. But one thing won't change. We'll still be bringing you the type of in-depth programming you've come to expect from us all through an Ontario perspective. Now, Kevin, no, Kevin, don't open up the shot. We want to keep it a surprise. Want them coming back in January. Let's hold off. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And we'll see you again Monday, January 4th, 2016, with a new agenda. Happy holidays, everyone. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.